Okay, so you're just about to use sensors in your smartphone to try and detect the number of steps you've taken. Um, so I think it would be appropriate to talk about what are those sensors and how do they work because the details are actually pretty cool. So let's start with what sensors does your smartphone have? Um, most smartphones have the same complement of types of sensor, although they're there's some variability in types, and then there's a lot of variability in the details of each particular sensor. Some pretty typical ones are accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, and barometers. One I didn't list in here, um, and one you might not think about as being a sensor, is the camera. Um, but the camera is actually a very sophisticated sensor that can be used for a lot of different things. Smartphones also have something called software sensors. The sensors that I've mentioned so far are all physical devices that measure some physical property and convert it into a number that will give you information about that property. Software sensors don't correspond to a single physical measuring device. Instead, they're purely software that combines the output of several different sensors and usually has some amount of processing to return a number that we wish that we had. So for example, one of the listed sensors in my smartphone is a significant activity sensor. The idea here is it would be great if there was a sensor that would tell us if the movement of the phone indicated that I was doing something intentional with it. For example, raising it to look at the screen. Well, there is no single physical sensor that can measure that. Um, but instead, we have a software sensor which combines the information from the accelerometers and the gyros, and there's some code which processes that sensor data, and then outputs a single number, a zero or a one, to tell me whether it looks like the movements of my phone are intentional or significant. So you can think of a software sensor as being a little program that will integrate the existing sensor values, and then output another value that we might care about, which is more complex than a physical sensor would be able to measure. One of the things that makes these so interesting is that these sensors are what are called MEMS sensors. MEMS is an acronym standing for Micro Electromechanical Systems, and they are very, very small. Uh, you can see from the diagram here that the MEMS scale goes from about 100 nanometers up to about one millimeter. So think about manufacturing for a second. Um, like, in fact, think about your ability to make things. Like, do you think that you could cut a wooden cube or a metal cube? Um, that was accurate down to, I don't know, uh, a millimeter, a tenth of a millimeter? These sensors are actual mechanical systems that are manufactured out of metal, um, and they're extremely, extremely precise. Um, and it's really pretty awesome that we're able to manufacture things that are that precise, that small. So inside your smartphone, there's a board that contains all the integrated circuitry. And then there's a particular chip that would represent one of the sensors, for example, uh, the three accelerometers. And this picture on the right there is actually a picture of a MEMS accelerometer. So all of those shapes that you're seeing are shapes that are etched out of metal. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but these back and forth things right there are springs, or they act as springs. Um, and so I think it's like pretty amazing that inside that little chip, it's actually a mechanical system that is doing the measuring. Before we get into the details about how that works, let's step up a level again. Um, what exactly do accelerometers and gyros measure? So each accelerometer and gyro is a three axis sensor. So that means it will measure something, some physical property in three different directions of motion separately. The accelerometer measures acceleration, which is the rate of change of speed. And it does so in three different directions. X would be uh, jiggling your phone left and right. Z is into or out of the screen and Y is up or down. Gyroscopes, uh, known as gyros, measure rate of rotation, usually measured in radians per second. And those are also in three axes, where the three different axes represent the axes of rotation. So if you're measuring uh, in the Z axis, that would be your phone is rotating around that axis right there. So it would be sort of spinning like that. Whether or not you have an Android device or an iPhone, um, there's lots and lots of apps that will give you direct access to your sensor data. Um, here's one called Android Sensor. And these values will update in real time as you're moving your phone. So here you see the accelerometer has an X, Y, and a Z, and they're measured in meters per second squared, which is a standard unit for acceleration. Um, this sigma, I believe, represents the vector sum. So uh, 
overall what's the acceleration of your phone in whatever direction it's moving in. If you want access to this data on your computer, there's kind of two ways you could do it. You could save the data as a comma separated value file, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, there's a lot of apps that will also let you stream the data over UDP. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. And in Python, it's just a couple of lines of code to be able to um, create a socket that can read a UDP stream. Um, and then you can just have access to the data and add it to a list. Uh, if I get a chance, maybe I'll record a video and illustrate how to do that. Here's a sample of what a comma separated value file might look like. I recorded this in a different app called HyperIMU. Um, strictly speaking, this is not comma separated values because these first, it looks like five lines, don't follow the comma separated values format. Um, the format really is values separated by commas. <clears throat> um, so if you were going to save this to a file, the first thing you'd need to do if you wanted to read it using a CSV parser is you would need to open it in a plain text editor and remove those first five lines. Um, if you check, I actually have already recorded a video illustrating how to do that. So let's start getting into how accelerometers actually work. I'd said before that an accelerometer is really a chip that sits on your board like this. You can actually buy your own if you want to. This is a product page from the Adafruit website. Um, and you can see the accelerometer is the little integrated circuit there, the little chip. Um, and they come on their own breakout boards and you can use them in your Arduino projects or whatever you'd like and they're pretty cheap. So finally, how do they work? You can measure acceleration if you have a spring and a mass whose mass you know, and uh, those two things are attached to some housing. There's two simple equations that will let you calculate what the acceleration is based on just those elements. So first, there's Newton's second law of motion, which is force equals mass times acceleration. And the second is something called Hooke's law, which says that force is equal to K, which is a spring constant, times spring displacement. So let me say a little bit more about each of those things. So the first equation, Newton's second law, um, you can think about it in two different ways. If you apply a force to something, that produces an acceleration. And so you can calculate what that is using the equation. The other way around, if your object is undergoing an acceleration, you can figure out what size force, what magnitude force must be causing that acceleration. Again, by plugging in what you know. So you plug in the acceleration that you've measured and the mass, and that tells you the force. The second equation, Hooke's law, describes the force that's produced when you stretch a, when you stretch or compress a spring beyond its natural resting point. So all springs have a length at which they like to rest, and then if you were to stretch them, you would experience a force pulling them at, or restoring them back to their original natural resting length. And that force is proportional to the amount that you've stretched it, which is called the spring displacement. So K is usually called the spring constant, and it's a measure of how stiff the spring is. And it's determined by things like the geometry of the spring, the thickness of the material, the particular type of metal used, um, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, but many springs, even that you just buy from the hardware store, will list the number for K right on the packaging. So let's put these two things together now. You'll notice that both these equations have force in them. So let's say that the housing that contains my mass and spring is undergoing an unknown acceleration that I want to measure. So acceleration is the unknown. I know the, the size of the mass, and so I know that the acceleration is going to be equal to whatever force caused it divided by the mass. I know that that same force is also causing the spring displacement, and if I could measure what is that spring displacement? How far did the spring stretch? And I know what K is. Then that leaves the only thing that I don't know is acceleration and I can solve for it. Algebraically, you can set those two forces equal to each other to get this equation. <clears throat> and then divide by mass to give you acceleration. So if you're trying to calculate acceleration, you can do so if you know your spring constant, you know the size of your mass, and you're able to measure the spring displacement. But remember, all of this is happening inside a tiny, tiny chip. So you have to somehow 
measure how far this tiny spring is being displaced. And if you can do that, then the chip can calculate the acceleration that moved that spring. And that acceleration should be the same as the acceleration of your entire device because the spring is mounted inside your device. So do those chips really actually contain a weight in a spring? The answer is yes. This is a picture of an accelerometer. Um, and the springs you can see are here and here and here and here. They're called flexures because they flex. As you move the phone, the, fl the flexures allow that entire assembly to flex back and forth, to move back and forth. And the spacing of the silicon fingers will change as that happens. The capacitance on the plates is a function both of the spacing between them and the overlapping area of the plates. And so as the whole assembly moves, that changes, and that's something that can be measured electrically. So the spring displacement is measured using the change in capacitance, and the acceleration can be calculated based on the equation that we just looked at from the spring displacement. There's a really excellent short video from the engineering guy, which I would definitely recommend you check out for a lot more details.